There is no difference between the deeply religious person or the morally bankrupt person. There is no distinction. Anyone who believes on Jesus Christ is righteous in the sight of God. That's scandalous. Good morning, Cornerstone. Good morning. I am a sinner, and there is nothing I can do about it. I am a sinner by birth as well as in practice. I am a habitual sinner who has no excuse, and the judgment of God hovers above me to rightly rain down his judgment. In my ignorance, I attempt to cover over my sinfulness by castigating and ridiculing those whose sins are more apparent than my own. But in reality, I am just like them, and the same judgment that awaits them also awaits me. But I am deeply religious. I am a principled person on the outside, but inside I am just as angry, just as hateful, and just as guilty as any murderer. And the depth of my religion is not deep enough to hide my faults from God. His judgment rightly awaits me on the other side of life. I am a sinner, and there is nothing I can do about it. And these are the lessons we learned about ourselves starting in chapter 1, leading all the way to the pre previous verse before our text today. These are the lessons that we have learned about ourselves. These statements and these observations represent the testimony of every man, every woman, boy and girl that has ever lived. It is the most bleak, but the most truthful depiction of all of humanity, that we were all born doomed that we never had a chance. We never had a chance to be free. We never had a chance to be whole. Our hearts have always been wretched and broken. Our tongues are filled with cursing and with bitterness. Our mouths are like open graves. And the future looked dim for us. And we were afraid to die because we we're afraid of being judged. And so some of us do all we can to increase the number of our years we eat right, we exercise, we manage our diets because we cannot afford to die. We say, just give us one more day to get our lives together, just one more day to make it right. But the bell will toll for each of us at some point. Each one of us will meet our maker eventually. And just beyond our death, there is the judgment seat of God where he awaits to assess the entirety of our sojourn in this world and to render to us his final judgment. And because we're all sinners, his judgment would have been the same for all of us, guilty. And that was the situation, that was the dilemma for each of us. But now, but now, Paul says in verse 21. And this phrase represents the pivotal shift in Paul's dissertation. This shift that Paul is about to make symbolizes a new state of affairs brought about by Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So he got the bad news over with first. He painted a drastic picture of the spiritual and moral condition of us all. He has stripped away from us any hope that we may have had that we could be good enough that we could be kind enough to earn our way into heaven. No one is righteous enough. And even if we were somehow able to obey the whole law of God as set forth in the scriptures, the law cannot and the law will not justify us. The law is impersonal in its decrees. The law is distant and the law of God is aloof. The law is ruthless in its determination. The law is meticulous in its estimation of our standing before God. This is what Paul tells us. This is what Paul will continue to reiterate throughout the book of Romans, that the law will never justify. I should emphasize the point that Paul's argument here is not against the law. His argument is against an assumption that God's righteousness is his commitment to people who obey the law. Paul is arguing against the misnomer that there is no righteousness without the law. It's untrue, Paul says. And when we think about it, Paul's argument flies in the face of all human knowledge and of all human experience even up to now. Think about it. What does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be righteous? To be good is to be approved. To be good is to be satisfactory. But by what standard do we measure goodness. To be found good, one must live up to some requirement, some rule, or some law. Goodness is measured in accordance with the law. 
And the more I adhere to the law in obedience, the more good I am. And the only way that I can be good is if I do good. This understanding, this is our understanding of what goodness is. This understanding of goodness remains the most pervasive interpretation of the subject throughout the history of the entire world. This is the understanding the Jews inherited from the law. That the righteousness of God is realized in the coming of his law. That the law gives us the perfect example of the character and of the nature of God himself. And if we want to live with God forever, we must be by nature and by practice just as righteous as God is. This was our understanding. But now, Paul says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. When we read this, even when I read this, I read it from my own perspective. I normally understand Paul to be saying that my righteousness, the righteousness that I have inherited stands apart from the law. But Paul isn't talking about human righteousness in this section. He's talking about God's righteousness. He's talking about God's goodness. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. So let's ask the question, how do we measure the goodness how do we measure the righteousness of God? Let me ask it another way. When I say that God is righteous, what exactly do I mean? According to what standard is God considered righteous? Is God under the law? If God is under the law, then the next question is, who judges God? Or who would correct God if God strayed away from the standard? We know that wherever there is a law, there must also be someone to enforce the law. Who enforces the law upon God? Is there anyone able to enforce a law on God Almighty? Is there anyone worthy to tell God if or when he's getting too close to the line? Who judges God? Well, God is not under the law. There are no laws. There are no rules that compel God to do anything. There is no law that can demand God's obedience. There is no standard. There is no requirement that God is obligated to meet, except those obligations that God places upon his own self. And in the most extreme terms, this is what it means to be free, to be compelled by nothing and by no one, to have the space to do, to think, and to act in accordance with one's own inner light without fear of reprisal, without fear of judgment. That's the freedom that God enjoys. Let's pause right there for a minute. Let me give a warning because I don't want anyone to misunderstand. I don't want you to misunderstand anything I'm saying or anything I'm about to say. When explaining these ideas of freedom and of life without law, apart from law, it could be easy for someone to misunderstand and to begin to fashion their lives in a way that is contrary to the law. But the text does not say that God operates in contradiction to the law. It says that God functions apart from the law, that God works his will despite the law. Meaning that whether there is law, whether there is not law, it doesn't matter. God is still good. God is good because God is innately good, not because of any external standard to himself. And this righteousness of God is now revealed to us without the law. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. And this, brothers and sisters, is an invitation to all of us who are sinners and can do nothing about it. We are sinners according to the law. But listen to this, God invites us to receive within ourselves the God life. And it is a life that functions apart from the law. It is a life that is not governed or ruled by the law. It is a life that cannot be measured by the law. The righteousness of God, he says, has been revealed. God has always been righteous. God has always been free from the law. We just didn't understand what it meant. God has always been inviting us to live with him apart from any regulations, apart from any rules. Because these rules and these laws have always been the barrier that kept us from entering into relationship with God. But as one theologian put it, beyond the barrier of the law at which we stand, there stands our God. He stands just beyond the law promising us that the law will not be able to block our way to him, that we can come to live apart from the law, that our relationship with him is not based on any merit or innate goodness of our own, that there is no law, there is no rule that can block us from relating to him, and there is no law, there is no rule that can force him not to associate 
with us apart from the law. This righteousness of God is the sovereign display of his power. And the righteousness of God apart from the law is our standing where there is no human possibility of standing. We have no chance. But we stand with God apart from the law, despite the fact that the law declares us unworthy and unrighteous. But now, the text says, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. It has been shown to us. This was not just shown to us in the coming of Jesus Christ. This standing with God apart from the law was proclaimed long ago. Or as the text says, as Paul says it here, it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. Abraham saw the day when God would judge the world in righteousness. Moses saw that day. The prophets saw it. Job and the psalmist saw that day. As one commentator put it, we are compassed about with a cloud of witnesses who stood all of them in the light of this day. For the meaning of every epoch in history is directly related to God. In his righteousness, every promise is fulfilled. The righteousness of God is the meaning of our faith. It is the answer to every human hope and every human desire. So we proclaim no new thing. We only proclaim the essential truth in everything that is old. It was witnessed by the law, by the prophets. And even the law and the prophets understood that God stands outside and apart from the law and that the law could not restrict God from getting to the people that he loves. And this is a critical thing for us to understand. That God's grace is nothing new. God's grace is not a New Testament thing. That there is a divine continuity between the Old and the New Testaments of the Bible. That there is and there always has been only one dispensation under which all mankind has ever lived. It is this eternal dispensation of the grace of God apart from the law. This doesn't mean that we may remain unrighteous though. We don't have to be righteous according to the law to have a relationship with God. But God needs to see us as righteous according to what standard? A plain sinner cannot stand before God. A plain sinner cannot be in relationship with God. But God calls us righteous. How can he do this? Paul explains in verse 22 that our righteousness does not come by our obedience to the law. But it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I don't want to beat a dead horse. But I do want us to gain a clear understanding of just what has transpired in the coming of Jesus. And what God has done is he has given us his righteousness through our faith in Jesus Christ. And he gives this righteousness to every person who places their trust in Jesus. He gives this ability to become righteous apart from the law. And despite the fact that the law still views us as sinners, even though in actuality we are still sinners, God calls us righteous. And this is scandalous. It was scandalous back then. It's scandalous today. This idea is contrary to the sensibilities of the Jew and the Gentile alike. But this is the heart of Paul the Apostle's teaching. This is the central theme of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That humanity can be righteous and unrighteous at the same time. That is the scandal of God. That everyone in this room can be righteous and unrighteous at the same time. This is the state of affairs with all who believe. What Paul says is that God's righteousness comes to expression through faith in Jesus rather than through obedience to the law. One commentator says it this way, that faith is conversion. Faith is the radically new disposition of the man who stands naked before God and has been wholly impoverished that he may procure the one pearl of great price. It is the attitude of the man for the sake of Jesus who has lost his own soul. Faith. The revelation which is in Jesus Christ is the revelation and the invitation of God to be made or to be called righteous even if our lives and even if our lifestyles do not meet the standards of the law. And this is the right that God freely gives to all those who place their faith in Jesus, Paul says, for there is no distinction. And this brings us back now. This brings us back to the larger argument that Paul is trying to make here, that there is no distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. That's where he started his argument. And he comes back to it here. There is no distinction between the person who is under the law and the person who is not under the law because God judges apart from the law. 
There is no difference between the deeply religious person or the morally bankrupt person. There is no distinction. Anyone who believes on Jesus Christ is righteous in the sight of God. That's scandalous. <laughs> why must it be this way? Well, Paul tells us why it must be this way in verse 24. Because all have sinned and all have already fallen short of the glory of God. You can't retrieve it. You can't get it back. There is nothing you can do to ever make up for it. If you're going to be eternally with God the Father, it will be because he called you, but you were not. There is no other way. Ah, there is no distinction. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And if we hope to secure eternal life with God, we will have to secure it apart from the law. And Jesus Christ has made the way for us to do just that. Because through Jesus Christ, God has justified us. Paul says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption of which is in Christ Jesus. Now, to be honest, we could camp out right there and not even read the rest of the book of Romans because in these few verses, Paul encapsulates his entire argument, justification, redemption. He, he, covered, he covers the whole gamut in these few verses. We are justified as a gift by the grace of God through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Justification, this controversial doctrine of justification. R.C. Sproul pointed out that this controversy involves one simple question. How can, he asks, how can an unjust person ever hope to stand before the just judgment of God? Because if God calls me just when I am actually unjust, then it would appear that God is not telling the truth, which would make God unjust and unrighteous. But God's justification of the sinner is not a misapplication on God's part. God's justification of the sinner is a monumental act of divine mercy. Paul says that God has justified us. God has called us righteous as a gift of his grace. <laughs> justification is a gift. God has shown us mercy through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. Paul says that God has displayed Jesus Christ publicly as a propitiation in his blood. Through faith. Propitiation, that's a strange word. A word I've never read or heard anywhere but in the Bible. Propitiation. And what Paul is talking about here, Paul is talking about the mercy seat of God. Propitiation. The mercy seat of God. Described in Exodus chapter 25 verse 17 through 22a. Where God says this to Moses. And you shall make an atoning cover of pure gold. Two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the atoning cover. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the atoning cover at its two ends, this mercy seat. And the cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the atoning cover with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the atoning cover. Then you shall put the atoning cover, the mercy seat, on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give you. Okay, okay, what is he talking about? Here's what he wants. Verse 22, he says, this is the place that I will meet with you at the mercy seat. This is the place that I will meet with you. There I will meet with you. I won't meet with you anywhere else because anywhere else the law holds sway. But at the place of my mercy... Where the law cannot dwell, this is the place where you and I can meet. This is the place where you and I can be associated with one another. This is the place where my judgment is suspended and where no law applies. This is the place that is apart from the law. There at the mercy seat, there in Jesus Christ, we stand before God justified, apart from the law, by faith in Jesus Christ alone, so that, so that faith in Jesus is faith in the mercies of God. It is faith that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross has forever satisfied the wrath of God, and that the blood of Jesus Christ stands throughout history as the place, the only place, where God and man can dwell together in peace, the place where God sees me as righteous. Because propitiation means to satisfy the demands of God's justice. 
And it is through the propitiation of Jesus Christ that we are saved by God from God. As Jesus Christ took upon himself the wrath that was assigned to each of us. He became the substitute to stand in and to take the pain, to take the suffering that each of us deserved. And in this way, Paul says that God demonstrated his righteousness because in God's merciful restraint, he let the sins that were previously committed go unpunished for the demonstration, that is, Paul says, of his righteousness at the present time. I love that. I love that. I love that. And here we get this glimpse of what the righteousness of God looks like. Because in God's economy, mercy and righteousness are one and the same. You can go back and read throughout the Old Testament, and you will notice that in most cases, mercy is not a prominent element of the law or of the commandments. You ever thought about that? That there is no law that says, thou shalt have mercy. There is no law that says that. In fact, often in the Old Testament, what you hear is just the opposite. If a person is a thief, he is to be stoned to death. If he's a blasphemer, he should be stoned to death. A murderer should be stoned to death. The necromancer should be stoned to death. And a host of other crimes are to be punished by being stoned to death. No mercy in the law. <laughs> mercy exists apart from the law. That's where God is. That's where Christ is. He's to be found in his mercy. And so Jesus Christ was murdered, crucified as the merciless punishment of the law for our sake so that God could satisfy his law while at the same time saving us from his wrath. Paul says it this way, so that God would be just or so that God would be viewed as not failing his own imposed, self-imposed standards, so that God would be just and so that God would also be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the scandal of the grace and of the mercy of God. That the just justifies the unjust. This is the solution that all of mankind needed. And this is the solution that we find in Jesus Christ our Lord. Because we are all sinners. Let me say it again for emphasis. We are all sinners. And there is nothing we can do about it. And so God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. All of us were trapped. All of us were headed for a calamitous end. But God, apart from the law, has given us his own righteousness. And now we are free. Apart from the law. There is a whole host of caveats that accompany this doctrine of justification. So don't just take what I'm saying today, but you have to stay for the entire book of Romans. I don't want anyone to think, well, I'm free from the law. I can do whatever I please. That's not what I said. In fact, even God himself made sure that he was just as he saved the unjust. He made sure that he followed the, the requirements of the law, not because he had to, but because of who he is. He remained just while he justified the unjust. And so there are caveats to this justification. In fact, you don't have to read very further along, very much further along in the book, and you'll see the first caveat, even in this chapter, that while we are free from the law, we still uphold the law. Brothers and sisters, there is a depth, there is a richness about the wisdom of God and the operation of God that almost defies words, that fills my heart with joy and with deep appreciation for the great lengths to which God has gone in order to secure my salvation. I thank God for his mercy today. I thank God because even when I am faithless, God remains faithful. And I don't have to fear being judged. So why do I try to keep the law? Because I'm grateful. Because I appreciate what God has done. Because I want to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's why we keep the law. Not out of a fear of punishment, but to bring glory to the name of our God. Let's pray.